Alexa, where are we? <laughs> Alexa, how come you weren't on stage at the Financial Force Com Live 18 <laughs> show this year? There's an answer to that question, Brian. I was not invited. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> how do you do the Alexa voice? I was not invited, Brian. Uh, you're not quite as, uh, you don't have the dulcet tones of Alexa, I'm afraid, John. Yeah, I was talking with Fred Studer, uh, the CMO of Financial Force, on the opening night, and I said, Fred, whatever you do, no voice demos on stage, because I've seen some disastrous ones this spring, and so have you. And we warned him about that in our keynote. Preview. That's right. Our unpredictions <laughs> deal is always right on the money. And I think I'm, uh, I've seen one out of 11 that worked. Yeah. It's brutal. Huge crashes. Yeah. Yep. Even if you practice and test it, it just fails. But anyhow, um, we, I'm joined by Brian Summer. I wasn't expecting to be joined by Brian Summer. That's a long story, but this is probably the last sort of show of the year. It's the Financial Force Community Live user event. We're at the end of June. It's piping hot in Vegas. We are in a totally nondescript hotel room, and the show is just about wound down, about a 1,000 attendees. And this company is one that we've been tracking for a while, but this is our first podcast on them, so we should probably step back and do the overview. Agreed. So Financial Force is a uh, company I've actually invited in on a selection or two from time to time. It's an all-cloud, multi-tenant accounting and finance system that also happens to have some other software in the PSA and other spaces. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, they, they, what's unique about them is they were built on from the ground up on the Salesforce.com platform, now called Force, uh, Force.com. And the product was originally spun out of Coda software and was called Coda to Go. And then uh, at some point, Coda to Go got going so well that Salesforce invested a chunk of money in there. And over the, over the years, uh, Unit 4, uh, Aggresso, which owned Coda, has decided to make this more of a joint venture between Salesforce, Unit 4, and they have money in there from crossover ventures and uh, from the uh, private equity firm of um, uh was it Advent International, I believe, is who has the money in them right now. So that's where they are. Uh, they sell well. They have competed against um, anything from anybody coming out of QuickBooks going, looking for something bigger, batter, to uh, competing against Sage and Intact and other products like that. All right. After a brief uh, room hygiene interruption, we are back. Uh, so... So that's sort of the overview of, of where we are. I think some other interesting things to note, uh, the new CEO has been in office for about 18 months, so right. he had some perspectives for us on sort of what he's accomplished so far. Um, there's some important, there's been a lot of changes, I think, in sales and marketing direction, which has kind of led a lot of folks to try to want to better understand where is this company headed. Um, I, I met with the new uh, chief revenue officer on the first night. He's been in the job for uh, almost, I think, about two months. So he's starting to get a, his agenda set. So we're expecting, I think, a lot of a lot of changes. I think still to come with this organization from kind of a go-to-market perspective. But the they did cite some numbers that showed there is some growth happening. Yes, hundred million. They, went, they were under just under 100 million in revenue in 2017, and they're telling us now they're at 110. Um, uh, they also closed something. Uh, they mentioned they closed 100 deals, but I'm not 100 percent sure on the time frame on that. You know how much time that took. Uh, 100 deals for a company like this, that could either be, um, if there are 100 small ones, it'll barely hit the top line on revenue, but if they include a number of bigger ones, and they did mention some bigger accounts here for sure, uh, then that could be, uh, quite, uh, quite accretive to the, um, to their financial statements. Um, I don't know where you want to go. Well, I think one interesting thing was just some of the news from the conference. This wasn't a conference that was full of, like, big news announcements, but I think the news kind of called attention to the points that you were making around what's unique about Financial Force in terms of their relationship with Salesforce and, and on the Salesforce platform because there was quite a bit about, for example, making use of Einstein AI capabilities in the analytics 
product and stuff. So I'd be curious in general just your thoughts on sort of what they were talking about in terms of, you know, leveraging Salesforce and blah, blah, blah. Well, in fact, probably the most interesting leverage point to me uh, we heard about a lot this morning, which was how they're leveraging a lot of the same partners that uh, Salesforce has. Right. And... They're trying to really take advantage of Salesforce's uh, channel ecosystem, whether it's for ISVs or systems integrators, and bringing them in, you know, much closer to financial force. Uh, so we got a, quite an earful on all that this morning from their new channel guy, and uh, again, he's new. Uh, they're also utilizing Lightning, which is the new user experience that uh, Salesforce has, and we saw pieces of that in some of the demos. I don't think it's all out yet, and I think they're going to be continuing to roll more of that out uh, over the next year with uh, the next couple of releases. Einstein, obviously, the big thing involving a lot of like um, artificial intelligence or big data crunching, uh, it's kind of, I, I would have to say that where so many vendors get, you know, so over-the-top giddy about using things like uh, AI and machine learning and natural language processing, while we didn't hear much of it really here today, you got to think about who their target market is and does their target market really have the people, the skills, the quants, and everything else on staff that can actually open up a multivariate polynomial equation inside the middle of an algorithm and figure out what to do with it. I kind of like that to... Um, Given a, a chainsaw to a four-year-old, if they ever got it running, you'd have nothing but a bloody mess on your hands. So I think they're taking a, me- a measured approach on how they want to move this kind of stuff out. And we've heard that from another vendor to it in this space as well. Yeah, and I did speak with a couple of their customers on this. I did a use case I'm writing up on JLL, which actually just won a business innovation awards. They brought the customer on stage to handshakes and smiles today. <laughs> but... uh but but he was talking about the use of Lightning and how that's made a big impact organizationally for them in terms of uh, a lot of it is just uh, once they got the user adoption around it, it uh, it's just basically helped folks to get a sort of a, that classic snapshot of the business, which is one of the big cloud ERP use case benefits you hear again and again is right. is is the so called single source of truth and like and the ability to visualize that easily and I think. The thing that I'm kind of struck by just listening to, to the customers here and talking to folks is that there is that sort of Salesforce advantage. Um, in other words, for example, they don't have to build all of their so-called AI capabilities from scratch. If, uh, my Digitonomic colleague, Phil Wainwright, wrote an interesting piece about this because while they're using um, Einstein for embedded analytics, um, they kind of have that advantage out of the box. Um, now, on the other hand, for some of the additional AI capabilities. They're talking about looking beyond just Einstein for that, and so we can get into a little bit about the pros and cons of, of being sort of committed to Salesforce. But I think it does give them some advantages from, like, in other words, they can punch above their weight. Right, and where I saw that in some of the other uh, sessions, it's where customers really get a lot of value out of uh, entering in let's say, an order or even prospecting kind of information in the whole, at the very beginning of the sales uh, or the order to cash kind of process. Everything starts off in Salesforce. It moves through, like, the configure price quote modules. It ends up as an order. It goes into the uh, financial force system. It goes through the revenue recognition rules if those apply, uh, you know, for those orders and uh, stuff, and all that's in uh, financial force. And you get this whole flow of things that's very much from a uh, services or product order moving all the way through into the financials. Mm-hmm. There, you know, clearly that integration is something that customers value because there's no leakage of data. There's no data error or data rekeying and everything else. And that's what a lot of folks like. And for those with complex uh, things where you have bundled items like, uh, product and service and or warranties all rolled in together, then you are going to want something that's got an integrated uh, revenue recognition capability within it. And by the way, I did go to a Riverick talk, and uh, I'm not going to write that up, but I would say that w- what I observed in there were a whole slew of private companies, accountants in the room, 
who are dealing with revenue recognition, ASC 606, and those kind of things, those requirements, they're dealing with those today where many of the public companies dealt with that stuff last year. So obviously with regs like this, the rules didn't change in the last year, so there's no new real big update on that. But it was interesting to see just the level of interest uh, among the Financial Force users on that capability. And for listeners that aren't following Financial Force closely but are interested in some of the broader themes, I think the the interesting thing about this company is that they have a very intense strength in, in, in professional services automation. And that ties into the vision that their CEO laid out in the opening keynote around basically the services economy, right, and redefining your business model around services. And I think that's something they're really banking banking on for their future growth, right? Like their big messages are, you know, be customer-centric and service-enable everything, right, and, and make it easy for for companies to, to transform business models. So one of the cases Financial Force would make is that your so-called legacy ERP provider can't you can't adapt to new business circumstances and new business service-oriented business models fast enough on these older systems, and that's part of the case they're trying to make. Yeah, the old uh, ERPs were designed in the 80s and 90s, and the concept of servitization was never even thought of back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, the products and the data models and everything else these things have were never designed for that world. A world where a manufacturer, for example, would actually have multiple modes of, uh, or multiple kinds of products that they would sell, including, uh, you know, things like power generation as a service, um, you know, um, and other kinds of things. I also thought what was interesting is uh, for the listeners, uh, a year ago, they kind of stepped away from the supply chain and right. HR markets. Uh, they had products in both of those. They'd actually acquired them, and I've even run into some of the people who, uh, maintain, support those applications, and they've got them available for customers. On the HR side, a lot of the customers apparently have very been, have been painlessly moved over to ADP solutions, and ADP being a partner of uh, Financial Force. But what's fascinating is in the one-on-ones we were having with the executive team, it sounds like supply chain, I think they're having a rethink on that. They know they have a lot of service firms who need right. some lighter weight supply chain, inventory management, ordering, and those kind of needs. And I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all we see something more formal come out of them about a resurging kind of supply chain focus uh, from financial force. Yeah, it was interesting because it, it seemed pretty clear. You had made that point last year, like, where are you going with HCM and supply chain? And it seems pretty clear that in the, in the year that's passed, they've doubled down on the ADP partnership, they're clearly happy with that direction. Yep. On the supply chain side, they, they were pretty honest that, hey, we're going to kind of revisit doing more of this in-house. And they, they're not planning to develop the kind of supply chain functionality that would compete with the cloud manufacturing players out there, the plexes of the world. But they, they feel like a lot of their customers need enough of that that it's worth developing. So that's another piece that we'll be kind of keeping an eye on in terms of how they evolve um, I, I can think of a couple of things that, that I think are interesting for them in terms of, like, the tension points going forward. One is the downside of, like, how are they going to manage their Salesforce loyalty and commitment to that platform versus providing adequate choice for their customers? I think that's a really interesting question. To what extent are they going to leverage other platforms? Like, so, for example, like in the... The Einstein space is a really good example of that because in the piece that Phil wrote up, he was talking about how uh, they did kind of comment, including their chief product officer was commenting around, there could be a looking at other solutions around uh, some of the more advanced predictive capabilities that they don't, they're not sure if Einstein's going to be able to do all that that they need, including things like um, time series based predictive stuff. Right. Um, so, so in other words, like how do you, how do you get the strengths of the Salesforce platform without getting too locked in in a sense that doesn't give you enough flexibility and choice? That's going to be an interesting dilemma for them, I think. I would love to be part of a board meeting at this company and hear them talk about their relationship with uh, Salesforce because they're, you're never going to get everything you ever want in life from a single provider. So let's just let's put that out there on the table. But more, you know, there is a lock-in issue as well that's kind of uh, a bit sub rosa. But I would, um, 
you know, I would actually encourage financial force to, in the words of Dear Abby, seek true love elsewhere in some mm-hmm. areas and like analytics and other kinds of higher order capabilities, particularly around dealing with parsing super large data sets, sourcing new da- big data, and possibly moving some of the computing load over to like an Amazon AWS mm-hmm. because Financial Force has a fiduciary responsibility to its customers to keep finding ways to reduce its cost of instantiating new customers or running the operations they have. That's not to say that Salesforce has necessarily been a bad partner for them in that regard. They, for, for no, no, I'm not saying that at all. They have a great platform and all that. But in time, uh, you know, these guys might want to look at more open source technology and uh, ever lower cost kind of uh, cheaper computing resources and bring those things to bear for their customers, at least for part of their offerings. Mm. Right, and the other thing I've been pressing them on, and they pretty much admitted they haven't made progress on this much last year, is is ISV enabling their platform so that uh, you know industry capabilities can be added in micro verticals and such. I mean, I think of all the Cloud ERP players, maybe they're most ideal for this because there's so many companies in different industries that want to service enable certain parts of their business that could use some of this PSA functionality, but they need it combined with industry-specific stuff that that Financial Force doesn't have. And I think the, the dilemma Financial Force faces here is that if they don't progress on building out that platform, then someone else is going to is gonna make too much progress there and they're going to get caught chasing the low-hanging fruit, right? right. It's, it's the dilemma of, like, they have a lot of business right now, for example. You mentioned all the Salesforce partners who are perhaps doing configure price quote type stuff that can tie right in. That's your low-hanging fruit or whatever, to use the horrible cliche. But but there's this whole platform piece that's really important. And they told us today that that they, that next year at this time we can expect a different story there. But I think that's one to watch because their main ISVs are really horizontally based stuff. Correct. So. Yeah, I didn't, you know, un, unless it was an analyst who brought up the name of somebody like a rootstock, which is an, right. also a Salesforce play, um, you, you didn't hear the horizontal story. I mean, the vertical story, it just didn't come out. Right. And I would agree. They need, if they really are at $110 million in revenue, we need to start hearing more on the verticals. Right. And more than services. That's not right enough. Yeah. They're doing really well in services and also tech and software, those are really their big, yeah, their big ones. So what else? The only thing I think I'd want to talk about has to do with progress they have made around partners and channels. Um, they've got a new channel chief in. We heard, uh, a, you know, some number of announcements in, involving a uh, ISV partner uh, program and a. Uh, as well as a um, integration or implementation partner program. They got tiers now. Yes, I think uh, like a gold tier and such. And they didn't have any of my favorite tiers. You know, polycarbonate and right. uh, cubic zirconia. Those are the kind of tiers I look for. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, but seriously. they're trying to enforce partner quality, which is good. Right, and it, yeah, and they want uh, they want quality partners, but they also want quality implementation. So I think their heart's in the right spot. Uh, but it, but all that was really so new. I think uh, the test remains to see what happens next year. I still, believe it or not, uh, John, I think probably one of the gold standards in this kind of market uh, would be the program, believe it or not, that Acumatica has. I mean, they have, they really have their act mm-hmm. together on how they do uh, the channel. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, well, they have to because that's 100% of the revenue. Right, they don't have a direct sales force. Yeah. Right, but these guys... Um, that would be the program I, I think they probably want to model more of their efforts after. Right. Um, I'm sure they love hearing our uh, competitive uh, pimps during the uh, podcast, but hey, that's, that's, that is what it is. You got, and, and, you know, look, there's more than one company that's going to succeed in this market, but I, I, I would agree with you on that. Hey, um, we can't, we can't end this podcast without discussing liquidity event. Oh. Huh. <laughs> I think you won the pesky question of the day award yesterday for that one. Yeah, uh, I think it was like my first one. My, the first question of the day, I, I went right to the point. You know, folks, I ask a lot of a lot of vendors, uh, the privately held ones, where are they on achieving the rule of 40? 
which is where you add up the uh, profit margin to the uh, growth rate the company's experiencing. And you, those two percentage numbers should equal 40% or better. Uh, for smaller firms, they're never going to meet that because they're burning capital while they're trying to get the um, growth engine kind of going. But after a while, you should hit some sort of steady state. And roughly the capital markets people think that you add the two together, you should get a number of 40 or better. Right. Uh, so I asked that question, and I also asked it because their private equity, you know, the Advent International kind of money, has been in there now for four years, and uh, a liquidity event should be coming up in about three years, would be my guess. Mm. Um, we didn't get a whole lot of, I would say, guidance on any of this stuff. Mm. Uh, we didn't get any guidance relative to where they are in meeting Rule of 40, and on the... Uh, liquidity event deal, it sounds like it's still a couple of years uh, b- away before they do anything. This company also has the added wrinkle that Salesforce owns a chunk of them. And much like the way NetSuite was acquired by Oracle, well, that was partly controlled by the fact that Larry Ellison personally owned a huge chunk of right. NetSuite. So if they ever did get bought out, I think we can pretty well guess who'd be on the short list of potential buyers, and but that's still... a it's still going to be out there a bit. So, story to watch. All right. So, no Alexa. That's okay. They they were trying to, in their customer centricity push, they wanted to, they offered up some redefined um, potential job descriptions. Like, so in other words, like if if you're really customer centric, then then like instead of having like a collections officer like. Like Todd Nielsen during his CEO keynote, he proposed these other titles for people like that, like um, revenue generation specialist. <laughs> so I proposed a few next generation job titles. Oh my God! <laughs> instead of instead of barista, pre robotics legacy worker. Oh. Uh, instead of flight attendant, laptop closure expert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about and, to hit a couple of them. Yeah, here right. In a minute. Yeah, okay. And I like that. And instead of TSA agent. Belt and shoe removal advisor. <laughs> so I think I'm getting. I think this customer centricity thing. I'm starting to like catch on to what what they have in mind here. So you you got one for uh, what is it? A comfort animal? I see those at the airport all the time. Oh yeah, the emotional support yes. animal. <laughs> yeah, the uh, um, furry pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, well, we'll have to think about that one. But but in general, like um, this notion of the servitizing everything, like I know you've been a little skeptical of servitization in the past. Do you buy into what Financial Force is selling here? Um, hey, it, it it's just it's just part of the continuum of as a service kind of stories that we hear everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think the. Uh, I think everybody's testing and experimenting with all kinds of changes in business models. I'm not, uh, personally, I'm just not as convinced that everybody wants the same thing in this world. In fact, we're going to have a profusion of combinations of like a product and a service, whatever. We're going to see this kind of stuff all over the place. Uh, I've even seen clients going like, Brian, why do I have to get this software on a subscription basis? I kind of like, you know, getting a perpetual license up front. Mm and uh, paying maybe a little maintenance later on, but knowing that they have the surety of keeping it. So I'm not, I'm not 100% sure that everything is going to move in, in a particular direction. Right. Uh, so well, so I think this is a time will tell point. So your view is things are in flux, but companies are going to respond to that differently, and servitization is one of the options that they might want to have, Correct. depending on what they're doing. And unfortunately, we don't have time to hash the rest of this out, because I think we've talked enough, but... Next year, we got to check back in on the data model stuff because integration with other internal products, but also in external integration with other data sources around everything from uh, social analytics to sensor data, all the things that you really need to make decisions. I, I think that story needs flushing out here. But And you're right. And it's, it is, without a doubt, one major lead pain in the you-know-what at companies Yep. It doesn't do a software vendor. The software vendor is not doing any good to customers if all they do is make integration within their product family easy. Right. That the, the problem are, are still all of these stupid things I see going on at clients where there's 
One system has to generate an output file that gets manipulated in Excel or Microsoft Access that then gets uploaded to another system. We've got latent data, error data. We've got problems all over the place. That integration headache, that's the story we got to track going forward. I think so. And, and I think what's really interesting is that you and I go, have been to a number of these sort of next-gen cloud ERP shows this year, and a lot of them have really good value propositions around um, you know, multi-tenant architecture, platform, analytics, they're in various stages with those things. This point we're just talking about is is a weak point almost across the board, even right. with next gen ERP companies. Not even not putting right. aside the legacy. This is a problem even with the next gen. Yeah, it doesn't do you any good to have this next gen, you know, cloud ERP if you still can't connect the stuff to a like a digital right. micrometer or a digital torque wrench or right. to or to the old cost accounting system they still have uh, running on an RPG on an old i-series machine. It's the integration stuff that's killing people and stopping the the digital transformation, whatever kind of projects that they want to do. And you're seeing this on the day-to-day in your demo settings with vendors, too, that they're falling down on this point. Oh, big customers time. Customers aren't happy. A- absolutely, big time. Yeah, the one I did recently where their idea of a... The digital frontier was to walk in with a barcode reader. That one's just like etched into my mind. Um, that's yeah. not enough. Well, vendors, for the next season, hopefully you can do better on those points. And, and there's a real competitive advantage to be seized if anyone has made it to the end of this podcast and wants to do that. <laughs> Listeners, I hope you've enjoyed the occasional run-ins with Brian. This is it for the season. Uh, but we'll uh, certainly pick it up again in the, in the fall with Brian next time I run into him. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, dude. You're welcome.